detection and inactivation. And he will talk uh, about one of these branches today, that is how to target uh, non -coding, long non-coding RNAs. So thank you, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, thank you, Jan, and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak and present our technology. Um, I feel a little bit strange about um, uh, speaking at a conference dedicated to a nanoparticle delivery because I'm not going to talk about nanoparticles at all. Instead, I'm going to um, talk about what can be achieved in terms of knockdown of an RNA in animals um, upon systemic administration of saline solutions of short LNA antisense uh, oligonucleotides. So uh, why is it important to knock down non-coding RNA? Um, so I just want to remind you that one of the really uh, surprising results of the next generation sequencing project of uh, ENCODE um, is that about 80% of the human genome is actually actively transcribed and only 2% of that is actually encoding protein. Um, so that, you know, uh, beckons the the question, what is all this non-coding RNA doing? Is, is it just junk or does it have important functions in, the, uh, in, in biology? Um, and uh, there are a lot of suggestions that they are actually important. Um, so um, one of the confounding results of genome-wide association studies has been that most of the disease variants are actually locating outside of in, uh, protein coding genes, suggesting that there are important uh, regions outside of the uh, the, the coding frames, um, and we of course know of several types of non-coding RNAs that have important functions. Uh, just a few of these, a very important um, group is the microRNAs, PWRNAs, and long non-coding RNAs, which is basically just a, uh, a group of different types of RNAs that are longer than 200 nucleotides. Um, one of the basic take-home messages of what, where we are at in, in terms of, of non-coding RNA biology uh, for the moment is that it's involved in regulation of gene expression. Um, and so since there's so much of it, it really is a very large untapped um, uh, um, source of new biological discoveries, but also development of new drug targets uh, because um, basically uh, drug development so far has been focused on, on proteins. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with microRNA or non-coding RNA biology, just give you a few facts about microRNAs. They're about um, 22 nucleotides long. Um, they derive from longer transcripts that are processed in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. Uh, they are um, loaded into the RNA-induced silencing complex uh, where they will bind with uh, imperfect base complementarity to the three untranslated regions of messenger RNAs, and there they will... Um, in most cases, um, attenuate translation uh, of the RNA. Um, they are um, supposed to be involved in, in probably far greater than 30% regulation of uh, expression of more than 30% of all genes. Um, the expression is highly tissue and development specific, and they're dysregulated in many diseases. Um, long non-coding RNAs, there are about 13,000 of these in the ENCODE database at the moment. Very few of these have been characterized. Um, again, the, the expression is tissue and developmentally um, regulated, um, and they're dysregulated in, in, in many diseases. There are different sources of these non-coding RNAs. Uh, some of them are antisense transcripts, so it's estimated that between 25 and 40 percent of all coding genes have a non-coding antisense uh, transcript. Um, and then some of these um, RNAs are located between genes and also um, expressed within introns. Uh, typically, but not always, expression levels are at least one order of magnitude below uh, messenger RNA. And a lot of these uh, RNAs are nuclear retained or have a very long retention time in the nucleus. Um, so do we have other evidence that they're doing something? Well, this is just a, a company, Regeneron, that um, made uh, knockout mice where they inserted a LAC-C gene into the non-coding RNA and as you can see you get phenotypes um, and um, they, uh, with the LAC-C they can actually also monitor the expression uh, pattern and this particular long non-coding RNA is expressed primarily in the lung, uh, this one primarily in the testis but also in certain specific regions of the brain, thymus, stomach and the colon. Um, 
the little we know about long non coding RNAs at the moment is that they're involved in epigenetics. Um, they they um, methylate histones. Um, they're involved in, in, in transcriptional regulation. Uh, they act as uh, enhancers and silencers, um, and they are thought to be able to provoke DNA looping. Um, they're involved in translation and regulation. Sometimes they are interacting with the three UTR of messenger RNAs. Um, they serve as scaffolds for proteins and RNA complexes, and they're also known to be sponges for uh, transcription factors and even the microRNAs. So Exicon is a company that's um, uh, it's a life science company. We, we um, um, develop um, research tools for the study of non-coding RNAs. Our technology platform is proprietary locked nucleic acid technology. This is a, a nucleotide analog and has the unique uh, property of greatly enhancing the base, the strength of base pairing. So by inserting LNA into a DNA oligonucleotide, we can greatly enhance the affinity for its corresponding uh, RNA target. Um, this has a number of applications. Um, this is particularly useful for short RNA targets such as microRNAs that are very difficult to address with um, classical uh, nucleotide uh, chemistry. And so we've developed a whole range of products for the study of microRNAs, um, microarrays, uh, qPCR systems, detection probes, and of course products uh, for gain and loss of function studies of microRNAs. Uh, and now we have also started to develop uh, tools for knockdown of other RNA, longer RNA species. Um, so I told you that LNA can increase affinity for its RNA target, um, but we can actually also use the, LNA, the way we spike the LNA to determine the function of the antisense oligonucleotide. So it's known that DNA RNA duplexes are substrate for RNAs H. We will degrade the, cut, cut the, um, the, the, the RNA and then cause the degradation of the RNA. Uh, LNA being a non-natural uh, base is actually an inhibitor of RNAs H, um, but we can nevertheless use it to greatly um, uh, enhance the potency of these um, RNA degrading oligonucleotides by adding LNAs to the extremity of the oligonucleotide and then having a LNA free stretch or gap um, um, where we only have DNA and which is recognized by RNAs H. Um, However, we can also use oligonucleotides where we have LNA distributed throughout the sequence uh, when we want to make sterical uh, oligonucleotides that cause sterical hindrance and don't degrade the RNA. Uh, this is the case for microRNA inhibitors. Uh, we have a lot of products for, for in vitro research and cell cultures, but um, today I'm going to focus only on the animals. Um, we make in vivo, custom designed in vivo inhibitors of microRNAs. Um, they're short and fully phosphorothioate modified. This modification um, makes the oligonucleotide completely resistant to enzymatic degradation and also increases protein binding, which is um, uh, crucial for, for um, improving the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of oligonucleotides. Um, before, um, so these oligonucleotides simply antisense to the microRNA. They don't degrade them, but they block them in, a, in an inactive complex. Um, before I show results for in vivo, um, I just want to remind you that antisense oligonucleotides are large charged uh, molecules that don't cross the biological membrane easily. And uh, in, in, um, in addition, when you uh, add these oligonucleotides systemically uh, um, into animals, they don't get an, uh, they have a very uneven distribution. Um, so this is a, a rat that's been administered radioactive oligonucleotide. And um, this is a radiogram, and you can see that most of the staining is in the liver and the kidney the filters of the blood. Uh, you get a little bit of staining in intestines, but other uh, tissues and organs receive very little oligonucleotide, such as, for example, the muscle and, and the heart. Um, here is results um, from another company, Isis Pharmaceuticals, using a very similar chemistry. Um, and they have administered these oligonucleotides uh, for over four weeks. As you can see, there's a huge accumulation in the kidney and the liver. And compared to the liver, you only get a few percent um, distribution to, to other tissues and organs, and, and, um, and basically it's been impossible uh, to get good knockdown of messenger RNAs with gap mirrors in, in the heart and, and, and muscle. 
Uh, so it's been surprising for us to see that actually our in vivo microRNA inhibitors have actually sparked a small revolution in micro, microRNA biology because it's basically enabled scientists to get knockdown of microRNAs in a broad range of different tissues and actually make important discoveries about microRNA function which could not have been achieved uh, with cell cultures. Um, so you can get activity, of course, in the liver and the kidney, but also uh, in, 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 in the spleen, uh, lungs, significantly in heart, uh, bone marrow, uh, endothelial cells, even in, in cinegraphs. Um, and I just wanted uh, to, to, to uh, make you aware that these are not the, the loose, usual lousy um, antisense publications of the 90s. These are actually coming out in high, high impact factor journals. Um, these are just from last year. And of course, our sister company, Centaris Pharma, published um, a phase two, results of a limited phase 2A trial where they show um, very promising results of using a Me122 inhibitor uh, for the treatment of hepatitis C infections. Um, is it just a few of, of um, potential therapeutic uh, targets uh, that uh, comes from the literature? Um, and I love to sh <laughs> this particular paper that came out in, in Cell uh, last, um, actually it's 2013, um, where they, they show dramatic um, results of, by using an uh, inhibitor of MIR-208, which is expressed specifically in the heart. Um, these mice are fed on normal chow diet and also high fat diet. Um, the control animal, of course, gets fat, um, but the MIR-208 a inhibitor treated animal is completely resistant to obesity, um, as you can also see in the, 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 the adipose tissue and the liver looks normal and they don't develop um, glucose intolerance. Um, these animals had exactly the same, ate this, exactly the same amount of food and had the same amount of activity in their cage, but they were consuming more oxygen and producing more CO2, so they had a uh, uh, um, enhanced uh, metabolism. Um, so now I'm just going to shift to, to long non-coding RNA and knockdown of that. Um, so we have been accustomed to using sRNA for knockdown of messenger RNAs. Um, and of course, these are double-stranded RNA molecules. And one of the strands is incorporated into the risk complex. And you get cleavage of the messenger RNA with complete uh, sequence complementarity. Um, but this is very potent um, uh, technology, but not perfect. Um, so of course, we now know that these sRNAs can also act as microRNAs and bind with imperfect um, complementarity and then thus um, affect translation of a number of other targets. Um, uh, of course, you can also, if you don't dose the amount of sRNA you get into the cell correctly, you might actually saturate the risk complex and therefore cancel out the endogenous microRNA re regulation. Um, finally, there's a passenger strand um, which can also be active um, since the risk complex is, is located in the cytoplasm, it's less efficient with nuclear retained RNA. And of course, um, unassisted uh, experience with uh, getting activity in, the vi in vivo has been um, quite disappointing. Um, so we have uh, chosen to look at some old technology which is based on single-stranded DNA. Um, uh, so these are the gap mirrors I talked to you about about before. Uh, they bind to, to uh, the messenger RNA target in the nucleus and there, RNAs H, which is located in the nucleus, we'll call it degradation of the RNA. The, the gap may itself is not turned over and can go on and degrade its next target. Um, uh, so uh, some of the advantages we have of this is there's no microRNA-like effect. It's not incorporated into risk. Uh, no chance of saturating risk. There's no passenger strand. Um, we can get efficient knockdown of nuclear retained long non-coding RNA because RNAs H is in the nucleus. Um, these are short oligonucleotides, uh, about uh, 16 uh, bases, so uh, we can get unassisted delivery, and we can also get activity in vivo, which I hope to show you. Um, our gap mirrors are 16 mirrors. Um, gap mirrors were invented, uh, I think, 26 years ago, and haven't been really been used very much in, in life sciences, only apart from a few uh, biotech companies trying to develop drugs. And one of the reasons was that gap mirrors were difficult to design. It was difficult to get good uh, knockdown. You had to screen about 40 oligonuclear, maybe 100, in order to get one that was good. It was much easier with sRNA. But what we have developed in, 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 uh, in Exacon is a sophisticated design algorithm that can give you gap mirrors that give good knockdown with a very high hit rate. Um, 
and I don't have time to go into the algorithm or how we developed it, but basically one of the Im important uh, factors, of course, is an evaluation of the target accessibility, uh, and also we do a lot to, to limit uh, the amount of, of targets. Just uh, one slide showing knockdown in cell culture. It's the very first customer we had, a pharma company that was trouble getting good knockdown of a membrane uh, protein um, in, in cell cultures, and here he tested five gap mirrors at different concentrations and get good knockdown volume. Um, so uh, MALAT1 is a long line coding RNA, um, which is ubiquitously expressed, it's extremely abundant, um, and it's nuclear retained. And in addition, um, knockout mice suggests that, uh, shows that the MALAT1 is dispensable for proliferation and normal development. Um, and we were attracted to this non-coding RNA for this, this fact because we reasoned that uh, with something that's expressed everywhere, if we developed a gap mirror towards this target, we would be able to see if we could get knocked down along on coding RNAs, you know, wh where, where we can get it, and can we achieve the same as we have done with microRNA inhibitors, that is, knock down in a broad range of tissues and enabling people to study uh, function of these long non coding RNAs. So this is uh, results from... Um, uh, Rainer Boone in Frankfurt, uh, he tested 10 gap mirrors at a high concentration. Uh, uh, most of them give knockdown, and some of them are much more potent. Um, you could also do just by adding the oligonucleotide to self cultures, and for these three uh, gap mirrors, he gets an IC50 on in, in the range of a few hundred nanomoles. He actually took these three oligonucleotides and then administered into an animal, just 20 milligrams per kilo subcutaneously, looked 48 hours after. And you can see we now get um, quite significant knockdown in, in, in several, in an auto lung, muscle, and heart. Remember, knockdown with gap mirrors has been virtually impossible uh, in these two tissue types uh, until now. Um, and he used this uh, gap mirror to study the function of MELAT1 in angiogenesis, and it's been published um, this year. Um, so we've done a little more elaborate study to see. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, it's just to see where we can get knocked down. Um, so we have um, uh, done subcutaneous administ uh, administration, uh, two times 50 milligrams per kilo per week uh, for in a period of 15, uh, five weeks. And we've taken samples two days, five weeks, and 15 weeks after last dose. And we've collected from 13 different tissues, six animals in each group. These are the first preliminary data we have, we have made. So you can see we get complete knockdown uh, in the liver um, and pretty significant uh, knockdown still after uh, five weeks and reversal to normal uh, after 15 weeks. When we look at muscle, um, we don't get quite as good knockdown, but here the effect is much more persistent. There must be some difference in the, the physiology of these two cell types. Um, and that's a simple version of the story. The more complex version is, of course, we had a non-negative uh, control oligonucleotide. In the muscle, we see that the negative control doesn't have any effect on, doesn't cause knockdown of MALAT1. But in the liver, we do see an effect um, two days after the, the, the last dose. This, non, this negative control is a mismatch control, so it actually binds to the target, but with much lower affinity. Um, and we think what's going on is that in the liver, where you have massive amounts of oligonucleotide, you will get off-target activity to, to uh, low affinity targets. Um, you know, one month later, when the amount of oligonucleotide is much lower, then you get discriminative ac activity towards the high affinity target. Uh, and of course, in the muscle, it never received much oligonucleotide in the first place, so there, the activity has always been um, selective. But that just shows you some of the limitations with antisense technology, because of course, we could have you know, used lower doses to get discriminative activity in the liver, but if the purpose was to knock down a target in the muscle, then it would be very difficult, even with the best designed oligonucleotide, to, to, um, to avoid off-target effects. So if you were to use nanoparticle delivery for, uh, for, for combined with antisense to oligonucleotides, I think what it needs to, to do is to prevent the massive accumulation in liver and kidney and achieve a more even distribution. Uh, of course, if you can engineer tissue-specific delivery, that would be nice. IV delivery is fine for life-threatening diseases, but more patient-friendly delivery methods would be good. And then, of course, we would like to reduce the toxicity in which comes back to the same fact that most of the toxicity you get with antisense oligonucleotides is actually liver and, and kidney. And with that, um, uh, I'll thank you for your attention.
Yeah, thank you very much, Niels, for this introduction, this uh, new type or <coughs> other type of non-coding RNAs. Uh, we may allow for one short question. Um, quick question. Uh, it's interesting you get a uh, delivery by sub, sub Q. Uh, do you have any information as to the mechanism of how that's uh, actually getting all these target tissues? Um, no, not really. Um, people have been using many different types of, of delivery or, or routes of administration, uh, IV, uh, intraperitoneal, uh, injection into the eyes, um, um, through the lungs and everything, and in the end you end up with more or less the same uh, type of distribution. Subcutaneous is useful because if you want to do multiple dosing, you don't have problems with the, 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 the vein disappearing. And also, sometimes with oligonucleotides, you can get acute toxicity. Um, and this is uh, mitigated by subcutaneous administration, probably because the release is slower. I, I guess I was thinking more of the mechanism of entry into cells. Yeah, I, very little is known about how they get into cells. And from, the, uh, uh, from a cost of goods point of view, if you're injecting uh, 15 mg per kg, that comes out to me about uh, a gram in a human, um, would you not necessarily be better off looking at some sort of delivery mechanism just from the point of view of your material? So uh, experiments with uh, primates and even with humans um, actually suggest that the dose required uh, is, is much lower than in rodents. Uh, so they'd be more uh, in the region of a few milligrams per week, a uh, few milligrams per kilo per week. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my last slides alluded to, you know, to the fact that there are problems with just uh, injecting directly into um, um, the bloodstream and, and some sort of assisted delivery would be good. I think most pharma companies that we've been speaking with for the moment are not so uh, appealed for, you know, formulating in, into sophisticated nanoparticles and that's because of the trouble of getting the acceptance from the regulatory bodies. Thank you. Uh, Okay, then thank you very much again. Yeah.